Okay, good afternoon. Many thanks for this nice words and thanks for the invitation for this meeting. It will be very difficult to take you awake after a nice presentation from Professor Joy Schwartz and also the others in, in the morning. And um, also, Okay, many thanks, sorry for this. Uh, okay, so my presentation will be a little bit different than the others while we speak about health impact assessment. And I received several assignments, so this is briefly my outline. So I want to, to speak about how we do comparative risk assessment and health impact assessment in particular. Um, I will try to review how, uh, how we derive the exposure response relationship for PM 2.5 and mortality, and I will speak about the WHO contribution for uh, plan of actions. And of course, because of the time constraints, um, I will cut some of the presentation to stay within the, the, the new time limit. You know, we are a little bit late. So first of all, uh, let's go to health impact assessment. This is a very uh, well-known concept from, from WHO. Basically, we want to assess the impact, uh, health impact of uh, any policy program or intervention. And that's, that has been well described by WHO since 1999. Um, w when we go to uh, air pollution, we might, uh, we might have two different uh, questions here. What's the burden uh, of the, uh, health, uh, of the uh, health effect of air pollution in total? And what could be the impact of exposure changes? And you see this, you know, this is, okay. And you see this. Okay, this is the effect of uh, having apple uh, instead of, uh, okay, sorry, it's not coming. But um, so basically we want to see the, what's the effect of uh, 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 the exposure here, uh, the total burden uh, of disease versus the comparisons with a different scenario. I'm sorry, probably because of the translation between window and apple, some of the slides are a little bit confused. So uh, the, the uh, very useful concept that we have from epidemiology is the concept of uh, population attributable risk, which is simply the difference of the incidence of the disease among the exposed and the incidence of the disease among the non-exposed. And you see here, uh, this, this is the excess risk. And of course, we, we, we can uh, uh, calculate the attributable fraction, which is the fraction um, of the disease which is due to, to the exposure. Very simple concept in, in epidemiology. And, and the main steps of health impact assessment have been described by WHO in a specific publication. You basically, you, sh you need, you need uh, air pollution data, you need population, um, you, you, you should calculate exposure and usually the population weighted exposure, you apply the concentration response function or, or it's also called the exposure response function and together with background da data you calculate the impact. So it's very simple. You, this is different than epidemiological study. The epidemiological study is concentrated in, in providing the exposure response function. This is uh, basically an exercise of estimation. So in this exercise of estimation, what we can produce, we can produce different 
uh, indicator. Well, one indicator is, of course, uh, um, uh, attributable death, but we can estimate years of life lost, years of life with disability, disability adjusted life years, but more important, we can provide information in changes in life expectancy, which is a very, very good indicator that people can, can easily understand. Um, uh, I found this, this uh, from COMEAP in, uh, COMEAP in in UK, which is the official committee on air pollution in the United Kingdom. There's a very nice document speaking about the meaning of, uh, the meaning of uh, this impact um, indicator. And, and first of all, we have to recognize these are indicators at population level. These are not indicators at individual level. And the, 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 the second concept, which is quite important, everyone dies. So what we can predict is anticipation or delayed death. So we are not saving death. We are just anticipating or delaying death. And these are average concepts, not for individuals. So it's very difficult to say which specific individual uh, uh, I, I has been killed from air pollution or which specific in individual the death has been prevented by air pollution. So this is important to clarify to people, these are population indicators. Uh, what information we need? We need, uh, as I said, exposure level. Um, we have to decide in our impact assessment what is the, the reference level? Or oh, it's also in jargon, it's also called counterfactual. So we might say, what's the level uh, we want to estimate the impact? This level could be the air quality guideline, for instance. Suppose we want to decrease the air pollution to the uh, air quality guideline, what would be the burden uh, uh, of disease above the, the, the air quality guidelines? Or we may say, Let's suppose that PM 2.5 does not exist or exists only at the natural background level. So we have to define this counterfactual. We have to find the co concentration response function and of course uh, health statistics and, and the population we want to apply this. So w what are the important assumptions in, in health impact assessment? The first one is that is a causal relationship. And, and uh, Bert Brunner was presenting today, uh, you know, the, the EPA evaluation on, on, on different outcomes. And, and of course, for some of the outcomes like um, uh, PM 2.5 and all cause mortality, there is a causal uh, relationship. But the second concept is, it's the call the portability of the relative risk. So we now are aware that uh, for long-term effects of air pollution, most of the studies have been conducted in North America, Europe, and some of them in China. So what we are saying is that we are generalizing the relative risk from these countries to other countries. And that's, of course, is an assumption that we make in our, in our health impact assessment. And this is very, a very important assumption. Uh, there are several uh, applications of the health impact assessment. The, as I said before, the burden of disease. But it's very useful for comparison of different scenarios. What if we reduce air pollution to that specific level? And it's very used in cost-benefit analysis. And actually, the, the European policy on, on air pollution has been conducted after the very accurate cost-benefit analysis. So now we go to the question, what about comparative risk assessment? What about air pollution in comparison to other risk factors? And, and we, we are well aware that in 2012, this publication was uh, first published. It was the Global Burden of Disease related to 2010. This is an important project that has been going on in, uh, during the years, and there is an update every year. And this is the, the graph coming from that publication in The Lancet in 2012. We were ranking uh, of the several factors. And you see, you know, in the, uh, in the top, uh, the top factors are, of course, high blood pressure, tobacco smoking, all the factors that we know. And it was surprise, surprise for most of us to see air pollution ranked among the biggest 
killers in, in the world. So this is a way to do the comparative risk assessment and the global burden of disease has continues to, 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 to do this. And uh, in, in the Lancet in May 2017, the global uh, assessment of the effect of air pollution and mortality has been published with this estimate, 4.2 million deaths attributable to PM 2.5 in 2015. So this is the the, the figures that comes from uh, from from GBD, it's m m and, and this is the map of the attributable deaths around the world, and you see some places in the world they they receive the high burden uh, uh, from air pollution, and other other places uh, much less. What is in interesting from this project? They also calculated the change in life expectancy, and this is a publication that came last year. And for each specific country, you have the survival cur curve for, I for the population in that country. This is the survival curve for China and the life expectancy for China. And, and you see uh, it's almost parallel line uh, uh, what is uh, uh, due to if we avoid air pollution. And th so in the case of China, I think the, the life expectancy is 76 years. If you reduce if you uh, reduce air pollution, the gain would be 1.2 uh, um, life in life ex uh, uh, years in life expectancy. And you see it's the same for Nigeria coming from a different uh, survival curve. So this is a nice, uh, a nice plot coming from this uh, study. So you see if you increase the annual average of PM 2.5, the change in life expectancy change, you go from zero to two years, uh, and of course the change in life expectancy is, is small, maybe six months or one year in, in some parts of the world, is much higher in China and other parts of the world. So this is a very powerful way of communicating people. We always say in, it, in Italy, air pollution is, is uh, depriving people of one year of life expectancy, which is, uh, 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 which is a, a, a very important uh, message. Um, what, w what WHO does, WHO uh, collect all the information regarding the exposure, so they have, um, uh, 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 you know, they collect all the information on annual mean concentration of several pollutants, including PM10 and PM2.5, for more than uh, 5,300 fixed monitors. They have uh, data from uh, 2010 up to 2017, and they are, of course, continuing. Uh, they show the levels of air pollution worldwide, and um, what they s WHO says is, of course, is uh, how much the total population is affected, and uh, wha what's the proportion of the population which is above the air quality guidelines. As most of the population, if you, if you, uh, with the exception of North America, of course, and, and some part of Europe, most of the worldwide population is above the air quality guideline. And um, uh, basically, the WHO adopt the global burden of disease methods for uh, calculating the impact of air pollution. So there are no differences in the in the in the in, in the methods. And this is the the publication from uh, from WHO is very similar to the publication in the Lancet from from the GBD. Uh, well, uh, WHO uh, makes also calculation of comparative risk assessment as GBD does, and this is comparative risk assessment for 2016 where you have uh, ambient air pollution here, and of course you have other factors like smoking and high sodium intake and low physical activity. So this is a very powerful instrument to show people how important is uh, air pollution. Uh, so now, now the, the next question is how we derive the exposure response function. And this is quite interesting, it's a matter of, of discussion and uh, it's a matter of uh, you know, scientific uh, interest. Um, so in, uh, uh, some years ago there were very, there, there were very few studies on, on air, uh, PM 2.5 and, and, and mortality. And this study is the American Cancer Society study published in 2002 about 500,000 
people in the US, and this study is producing nice graph of how all cause mortality is increasing with increased PM 2.5. But you see the range of the exposure here is goes from 10 to about 30 micrograms cubic meters. So the question was, in 2004, when people wanted to do, to do the global estimate of air pollution, uh, uh, they basically thought, okay, we have data from, from these levels, so we know that according to the American Cancer Society, that is a linear relationship between PM 2.5 and increase in mortality. But what about levels of air pollution which are higher than 30 micrograms cubic meter or higher than 50 micrograms per cubic meter. So we can do, we can do the linear uh, extrapolation, but as soon as we go to China or to India, we can predict that everybody dies from air pollution because of this linear extrapolation. So this is clearly not true. So what we can do, this is people in 2004, so we can say, okay, we have a linear relationship here, but as soon as we arrive to 30 or as soon as we arrive to 50, we don't allow any further increase. This is an assumption, of course. But, of course, this is not a good assumption because it's not based on, on real data. Uh, there is a guy here that was also mentioned from Joyce Walsh, it's uh, Arden Pope, that had this bright idea and it was, let's, let's look air pollution data together with uh, smoking data and let's look how the uh, exposure response curve is. And the E clearly showed that the exposure response is not linear, it's curvilinear. So from that, there was a, a nice idea that was uh, developed in 2014, which was to integrate the data coming from air pollution studies, data coming from studies on secondhand smoke, and data coming from uh, uh, active smoking to build up a sort of so-called integrated exposure response. So this exposure response is coming from a mixture of different studies. And this mixture of different studies, of course, consider that in the observation there is a gap in the middle because uh, uh, we can arrive to some concentration with secondhand smoke, but of course active smoking is much more higher. Uh, what are the assumptions for applying this integrated exposure response is that PM 2.5 from different sources, they have the same toxicity. And this is, of course, a very important assumption. You know, we are saying that for the same amount of PM 2.5, either coming from air pollution or coming from cigarette smoking or coming from uh, passive smoking, the effect is the same. And this is something that uh, Bert was already uh, commenting in, 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 the, in, in his presentation. And, uh, and uh, what, what the uh, GBD is basically saying, we can apply this to only to some specific diseases, ischemical disease, stroke, uh, COPD and lung cancer mortality, and, and more recently to diabetes mortality. And these are the curves that have been produced in, uh, from GBD in 2015, and you see all of them are curvilinear, are not linear, are curvilinear, more, more or less approaching uh, uh, the original observation from Arden Pope. Uh, so I already said the, the, the assumption for the ER um, and, and w w one of the limitation is that uh, for low level estimates, this, as this uh, uh, the, the prediction is, is maybe not uh, very much uh, uh, accurate. So it produced underestimation and low exposure. So from there, uh, we have two main, and this is important for us to understand the difference in this uh, um, impact assessment. So uh, there is one stream, people, especially in Europe, uh, not worrying about high levels of air pollution, you know, staying within the 30 micrograms cubic meter, saying we can apply the linear uh, relationship. There is no need to apply this integrated response function. So there are several applications based on the linear or log-linear function. On the other hand, if you want to go global, 
If you want to make the risk, the, the impact assessment for all the world, you have to use the, in, the integrated exposure response function. And this difference is, uh, is very important because people can always say, okay, we have different prediction for air pollution. And there's a recent report from the environment, European Environmental Agency which has different numbers than the GBD. How it comes? And the solution for this, uh, uh, the response for this question is very simple. The, uh, uh, the European Environmental Agency has been applying what the, uh, has been the results of a meta-analysis conducted in 2013, which is basically applying a linear function. So when you see applying this linear function, the environmental, the European uh, uh, Environmental Agency is applying this uh, this function, uh, having a counterfactual value of zero, which has been heavily criticised because it's very difficult to find a place where there's zero PM 2.5. Uh, after the critique, they have applied also a, a counterfactual value of 2.5, which may be also too low. And you see from this. Uh, exercise, you, you see different um, uh, impact assessment, different numbers for um, uh, uh, the, the calculation of attributable debt. If you compare the GBD methods and the uh, environmental, uh, European Environmental Agency, you see the, diff the methods are different regarding the concentration, they are different regarding the counterfactual value. Um, the the uh, European Agency is, is uh, only based on the, uh, air pollution studies. The, this is uh, more the integrated function. This is applied only to few diseases. This is applied only to uh, to all cause mortality. And as a result of this, if you see, as this is a slide from from Bert Brunegriff, if you see this application as an example for total European Union, uh, you have uh, 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 250 to 58,000 deaths attributable to air pollution according to GBD and also WHO, and you have 399 according to the European uh, uh, Agency. The main reason for this difference is the different methodology, and we can well understand this. This is not that one is more valid than the other. It's different methodology that produce different, different results. Uh, so I said before, uh, everything is based on this meta-analysis, providing 6% increase in risk per 10 micrograms cubic meter. And uh, uh, of course, I have tried to, uh, to update this and uh, uh, having more studies. Nowadays, we have uh, uh, a relative risk, which is 1.10. Uh, the question is, this is basically North America and, and, and Europe. What, and and the, 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 the question is, what about Chinese study? And when we go to Chinese studies, before 2017, we had only two studies. One is predicting 0.8% uh, uh, increased risk per uh, 10 micrograms. The other one is, is predicting 2.4, so much less. So th those two studies were indicating that the form of the relationship is curvilinear. So it's much less at the higher level. But you know, in science, you never know, surprise, surprise. This study was well, a large study in China that has been published at the end of 2017. What's the relative risk for this study? 1.09, 9%. Very similar to the meta-analytic uh, value that was derived from uh, European and North American studies. So this is a big question mark. Is the relationship curvilinear or is the relationship linear? Of course, this is only one study in China. We need more studies to address this issue. Uh, there are uh, other uh, efforts for, for doing this. One effort has been done uh, by uh, Rick Burnett, compiling the, all the data from uh, all the, the available um, uh, studies on, on uh, air pollution and PM 2.5 and mortality. And you see for most of the study, the relationship is curvilinear. And the, the update uh, meta curve that we have is curvilinear, but is also approaching linearity. And this is considering the new Chinese study. So 
the key message is that it's, uh, it's possible to calculate the burden, uh, assumptions are different, the methods are evolving, and new studies are, are coming. And just the last slides to, to say what WHO is doing for this. WHO is doing um, a, a lot of activities. The most important one is to provide indicator for sustainable development goals. So these indicators are the custody of, uh, of the WHO. And uh, several other activities I want, uh, I want just to show you very briefly, provide scientific evidence, uh, update the air quality guidelines, as, as Bert Brunacher was saying today, S the air quality guidelines is being updated, and it's, a, it's a process that is going on in Bonn. Um, capacity building, uh, policy development, and, uh, and WHO has a global platform on air quality on health, which include all the specific agencies uh, taking care of air pollution. What, the, uh, what WHO says, um, Air pollution is an issue for several sectors, it's not only one sector. Says the health sector has to have a leading role in air pollution. And um, in, the, in the November 2018, there was a large first conference on air pollution and health coming with several recommendations that you, will, you may see in the document. But one basic recommendation for the health sector was to conduct health training. So to conduct health training for the clinicians, but also for the old uh, public health professional. And this training may go with uh, a young movement that is coming uh, everywhere in the world, which is very nice, uh, and it's maybe some fresh air for us as a scientist. And that's the end of my story. And I thank Sophie Gumi from WHO for her help. <laughs>